All right, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Mike Scanlon. I'm the Executive Director of Strategic Communications at John Carroll and a proud alum of the class of 2006. Uh, we have uh, a great webinar planned for you tonight to go through our planning for the fall semester uh, here at John Carroll University. Um, we'd like to give it just a minute here to allow folks to get onto the link. Um, and while we wait, I'd like to uh, express our thanks for all those who've sent questions in advance. Uh, please know that we've read all the emails and we will incorporate as many answers as possible uh, from the panelists this evening. Uh, if you don't hear your answer, don't fret. We will be replying uh, to some of you directly for some of the more nuanced questions. Uh, and if you have questions after the fact tonight, you can feel free to continue sending them to us at COVID dash response at jcu.edu. And with that, uh, I would like to welcome uh, a new member of John Carroll University's Jesuit community, uh, Andrew Sarah from the Society of Jesus, uh, who will begin tonight's webinar with a prayer. Andrew. Thanks, Mike, and welcome everyone. Uh, it is a joy to be with you um, I'm coming to you from the chapel at the Jesuit residence across from campus uh, where all of us in the Jesuit community have been praying for you uh, these days. And so I would like to continue that prayer with you. Um, so please join me if you wish. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord God, we gather in gratitude this evening for this John Carroll family. We gather with all the expectation and hope and excitement for a new semester, a hope for new friendships, new learning, new adventures in grace. Like St. Ignatius, we lift up our minds to you, Lord, and we see you looking at each one of us, intimately known, intimately understood. Give us that interior knowledge and feeling for your look for your gaze that calls us out of ourselves and into deeper friendship with your son, that we may follow him more closely in joy, in suffering, in service, and in love. Bid us, as you did, Ignatius, to have hearts bigger than the world and voices that sing with the psalmist, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory. And so we entrust this semester all of our desires our fear, anxiety, our very lives, to the most sacred heart of your Son, and it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Andrew, thank you, and, and welcome to John Carroll. Okay, and now to our panelists. Uh, as we've seen in the emails that we've sent in recent weeks, uh, we have a number of topics to cover tonight. We're going to start uh, with a general welcome and then move on to discussion about our academic plan, the high flex model, uh, the health and safety protocols that we have put in place here on our campus, uh, plans for residence life and the dining halls, uh, an overview of what students can expect uh, in student life and their experience on campus, uh, and then we will cover any topics uh, via a Q&A at the end that we've missed. Uh, but to begin, I'd like to welcome uh, the president of John Carroll University, Dr. Michael Johnson, to give some opening thoughts. Dr. Johnson. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, Andrew, for the prayer. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. I want to open by expressing my thanks and appreciation to our students, parents, and families for your incredible flexibility and patience over the last five months. We know it hasn't been easy for you. Some of you are making preparations to come back to campus, and others are preparing to make the transition from high school to John Carroll. All of you are adapting to a new way of life in response to COVID. Here at JCU, we've been monitoring the pandemic on a daily basis dating back to last winter. Our COVID-19 task force meets multiple times each week to assess, recommend, and deliver our university response to the pandemic. A cross-functional team of campus leaders also spent much of the summer reviewing and implementing a strong and adaptable academic model for the fall. This evening, our team of faculty, staff, and administrators 
will explain the steps we are taking to ready our campus for your return. Our priority throughout the situation continues to be the health and safety of the John Carroll community. With your health and safety in mind, I want to acknowledge that our response to the COVID-19 pandemic evolves every day. The circumstances that we are dealing with continue to change, and that's we, why we are so appreciative of your patience and flexibility. We have plans that are ready to be implemented for living, learning, and working at John Carroll. Even still, there are several variables that we, and many institutions like us, continue to monitor. One variable is the need for our entire community to follow the strict health and safety protocols at all times including when you're not here on campus. As it relates to the conduct of our community, I want to be clear. A lack of cooperation by one individual who refuses to wear a mask, practice physical distancing, or follow hygiene expectations could put our entire community at risk. Just wit to witness what is happening now in professional and college sports. The second variable is the availability of consistent COVID-19 testing. We are prepared to test symptomatic students and provide quarantine and isolation options for our campus. We are working with our hospital partners as well as private labs to add, our, add to our testing protocols as we continue to monitor the virus numbers in the state of Ohio and Cuyahoga County. I wanna be clear that our intention remains to bring our students back to campus for the fall semester, but only if and when it is safe to do so. At present, we remain concerned about the level of cases in the state and across the country. So the only breaking news of the evening, so to speak, is that there could be a delay to in-person living and learning at JCU. Let me say that again. There could be a delay to in-person living and learning. This would mean a phased in approach to opening campus where residential students would not move back to campus in August, but sometime shortly thereafter, hopefully, as, the situ as we monitor the situation. Um, <clears throat> we will, of course, begin all of our academic courses on schedule uh, at the end of August, but that will be remotely uh, in, in the case of a delay. We think it's important that you have the opportunity to anticipate this possible change. Uh, before we commit to any delay, our faculty and staff need to work through the answers to all the questions you might have about the impact on your return to campus, your fees, and your overall experience. In the meantime, everything we will be covering this evening remains 100% relevant. We expect to make any decision regarding a delay in the next week, and we will send a comprehensive message to all students and families as needed. You are always welcome, as Mike said, to send your questions to our COVID email address, covid-response at jcu.edu. So before I ask our provost and our chief information officer to explain the high flex academic model, I wanna leave you with three things. Number one, your health and safety are our number one concern and will drive the decisions that we make. Number two, the team who you will hear from tonight and many behind the scenes are working tirelessly to implement plans and protocols that make on-campus living and learning a reality this fall. Number three, at John Carroll University, we are men and women for and with others. While we have a strong plan and protocols in place, we must all do our part to ensure that our community remains healthy. So wear your mask, stay six feet apart, wash your hands, and if you feel sick, quarantine yourself and call our health center. Now I'll turn things over to our provost and academic vice president, Dr. Steve Herbert, to help you understand the high flex model. Steve? Thank you, President Johnson. It is a real pleasure to be with you this evening, and thank you for joining us. When we, uh, when we left you in the spring, we were busily transitioning our in-person instruction to a, a form of remote instruction that no one anticipated. I want to reiterate that we will be begin our instruction on Monday, August 31st, as planned. We quickly pivoted to a, a model of instruction called the HyFlex. It's a model of instruction that's been around for many decades but it's been advanced of late because it affords a great deal of flexibility to students in particular in choosing how they best learn. There, there are a number of different models in the HyFlex um, pantheon. You've probably heard of them as the flipped or hybrid classroom 
flexible instruction. There are other names. They all have different variations. But what they do is they allow both faculty and students to be flexible in delivering and receiving their instruction over the coming semester. So that is why we chose it. So here's the basic idea. If we take the rote or fact-based elements of learning out of the classroom time and make them available to students on demand, that is 24 seven, or we, we call it asynchronously, and that's usually delivered for an online or a, a, an online um, a platform for efficiency. And you do things like practice, you read parts of the book, um, uh, or uh, just sort of develop a basic understanding. You, you allow more time in class or in person synchronously where we're together to give it the most valuable. And so we can do things like practice problem uh, solving, we can do engaged learning, we can do group work, we can do the deep discussions that you see in a lot of our humanities classes. You can do feedback and evaluation, creative processes that you cannot do what we would call asynchronously when you're not together in person. In fact, many of our faculty have been doing this for quite some time, um, but we didn't always make best use of the technology platforms that we had to do things on demand. That is to allow for, uh, students to do this out of classroom time or alone. Um, well, let, me, let me amend that. In fact, we have had a mechanism to do that with technology. It's an old technology we're, that we're used to. It's called the book. That is the first version of a flipped classroom uh, because the book is on demand. You can open the book anytime you want. But we have now better tools and, and uh, newer tools for us. And we've spent a lot of time with our faculty over the summer to help them double down this model and better use the technology platforms that we have available. Our faculty have spent more than 25,000 hours in professional development over the summer since May and countless hours reworking their courses to make them more accessible to students, regardless of whether they're going to be with us in person or with us remotely. So we've really taken pains to enhance the classroom experience over what you experienced in the fall, uh, or excuse me, in the spring. And that's because we didn't have time to do that. We've taken the time this summer. So I wanna emphasize the, the HyFlex model is, there's some new elements to it, but it's not gonna be as new as you might think. Now, why did we do this? Well, we knew uh, or we anticipated that the fall would still bring challenges as far as to how we we're gonna to be together especially with regards to physical distancing, mask wearing, and other safety protocols. So uh, we challenged our faculty um, to come up with this model. And so we, we, um, we knew that students might not be able to be with us uh, in the classroom together because of classroom capacity issues. Physical distancing guidelines said that classrooms that formerly uh, would have held 20 students now might be limited to half as much, 10 or so. We know that there are health concerns that might prevent students and faculty from being present with other students. We wanna emphasize that if students, faculty or staff do not feel well on any day for any reason, we encourage you, we ask you stay off campus. We do not wanna put any of us at risk. So if you don't feel well, we ask you to stay out of the classroom and off campus as much as possible. If you're in the dorms, you stay in the dorm rooms. Um, there are also personal challenges in, in these days when, if we're remote, we, we're, we don't have sort of the isolation and spaces where we can devote the time directly to our instruction uh, or learning. And so with the personal challenges that life has gotten more complicated, sometimes you may not be able to be in, with us in class. And so in those instances where you either are, intend to go remote or find yourself having to go remote on that day, that is take and attend class remotely, typically through Zoom. This model allows us to pivot and accommodate you um, seamlessly. Now, I wanna take just a minute and explain, we, we interchange this word online and remote. And I, I, wanna, I wanna emphasize that for the last several decades, we've had what's called online learning. And that has typically meant that uh, if you take an online class, you're getting your instruction, we would call it asynchronously. You typically do not meet in person with an instructor or often with other students. It's usually set up that way. Um, over the last several months, especially as, as countless colleges across the, the country have really started delivering their classes remotely, 
we have conflated that with, we call it online because we deliver it in an online experience, usually over the web or through Zoom or through some other platform. And so online versus uh, in-person has come to mean certain things. So I, I wanna sort of avoid that and say, we're talking about remote learning, not online asynchronous learning. We still expect to experience, to deliver the kind of experience that you are used to from John Carroll education. That is, you're gonna have personal interactions with your, with your professors, with students, and with the staff who support you. Um, who will be on the online classroom and who will not? We've surveyed almost all of our students to determine who is planning on being fully remote, in person or mix in certain cases. Uh, we have certain cases where labs are better delivered in person and some students who are signed up for labs wanna know how that's gonna work, which I will address in a moment. We have those numbers and we've given that information to the faculty. So the faculty in general know who in their courses desire to be or plan on being remote full-time, who are in plan to be in person full-time. And then there are times when we, then we have to be flexible because a person who would be in person in class may not feel well that day and decide not to come in appropriately. And you would be asked to inform your faculty member that I don't feel well, I'm not gonna come in. Uh, or I, I have a cold, I have the flu, I have uh, uh, the virus, I have something. And so we're, we're trying to allow for that possibility. Faculty have been working with the registrar to determine who in their classroom have desired a remote instruction. They're, they're looking at the capacity in the classrooms that have been assigned to them and the size of the class. And they will determine who will be in the classroom and who will be remote depending on uh, the, the sizes that are, are necessary. And if there's a rotation, how that's gonna work. Faculty should be communicating to that, that to you in advance of your first class or perhaps on the first day of classes so that you have a clear understanding of who is expected to be in the classroom and who's not. So uh, a couple of, of expectations, expectations of faculty. Uh, faculty will still have office hours. That is, that is uh, uh, general. They will often be remote now because we're going to limit the uh, exposure that we have in person as much as possible. So faculty can talk to you after class, but more likely you're going to meet up with faculty via Zoom uh, remotely. But they will have times for that. We expect faculty to have engagement in the classroom. We expect them to be accessible uh, off hours within reason based on their, um, uh, their office hours and we expect them to deliver synchronous instruction. Now, I wanna, I wanna be clear. There are some classes that we offer that are listed as online, and in many of those cases, not all, that means that they will be delivered asynchronously. That is, there's no planned interaction with students, um, uh, in-person synchronous interaction with students. That is a, a very small fraction of our courses, and you will be informed of that if that's a, the case in that, that class ahead of time. Most of the classes will have some version of, they will all have synchronous aspects. Some of them may include what we would call asynchronous. For instance, a Tuesday, Thursday class, you might meet Tuesday in person, Thursday online. That, that may occur regularly, it may occur irregularly, and faculty will keep you uh, apprised of that. It depends on the nature of the course, the nature of the instruction, the kind of interaction that they plan. Um, but all of our classes, with the exception I just mentioned, will have a synchronous portion, whether it's in-person or remote via Zoom. Expectation for students. We expect you when you come on campus to wear a mask at all times when you're not in your dorm rooms or alone. When you're out in public, when you're in the classroom, you must have a mask on. We expect you to respect the physical distancing requirements. Um, we expect you to remain engaged in your courses and let your faculty know when you're challenged to, uh, with what's going on in your life. That is, if you're not feeling well, if you're sick and can't operate, if you have personal or job obligations, um, be aware that the faculty have a right to expect your engagement in the course. And if you cannot be present or in person remotely, then you are responsible for catching up on the work, right? Just because you have a good excuse for not being there doesn't mean you're not responsible for the work. Our hope is to record the lecture sessions via Zoom and make them available to students for makeup or catch up purposes. If you cannot be present synchronously, then you have the opportunity to catch up with that. And I, I wanna emphasize this is not an excuse to miss class, um, but there are good reasons where you can't be present both synchronously or in person. Like the spring, we ask that you have patience with each other and with our faculty as we navigate these very challenging times. 
if you're, and I want to emphasize, if you you find that you're struggling for any reason, that is, you can't keep up, um, you're you're under stress, you have personal obligations you have to navigate, please reach out to us. Let your faculty member know. We have other members of our uh, advising staff that will be happy to help you. Um, we can help, but you sometimes have to let us know. You have to reach out. I want to address one last thing before I, I uh, kick it over to our technology. Um, our labs are designed initially to be very interactive and in-person. Our science faculty in particular, and in others who are involved in engagement learning, have worked very hard over the summer to develop experience that will deliver labs remotely when possible. In some cases, it's not possible. But in other cases, they've done, been very creative to do that. And so if you're a remote student who has a lab, um, you will be uh, instructed, you will be contacted by your lab instructor as how that, will, that might work. In some cases, we don't have good answers. Those are usually upper level labs that require equipment, but in many cases, our faculty have worked hard to deliver a lab experience that will be commensurate with uh, uh, the needs of the course. Um, specific questions should be directed to uh, the science chairs or the faculty members that you have. We also have an associate dean in uh, College of Arts and Sciences who's a scientist who will uh, be working through that. If you have questions, send the questions to our COVID-19 um, web or uh, email. And now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jim Burke, who's our chief information officer and the head of instructional technology and servicing tech technology services, who has been uh, responsible for really putting in place and delivering much of the technology that's going to make our in-person and remote experience as seamless as possible. Jim. Thank you, Dr. Herbert. It's really been a very fun summer um, from a technology perspective, working with our faculty and students to come up with some technologies in classrooms and other places that will really seamlessly allow us to deliver this high flex model that Dr. Herbert just detailed for you. So in the spring, you may be familiar that we moved with Zoom and our learning management system, Canvas. So all of the asynchronous pieces and the synchronous video um, really helped us a lot. It gave us a lot of information about how we needed to work um, to integrate things in the classrooms. And so working this summer with our faculty and our students, we've been able to come up with a design and every classroom that has classes and it will have at least a camera and at least one microphone so that we can link the students in the room with the students and the faculty who may not be in the room. Um, the speaker system in the room itself will broadcast the remote students. So you have two-way communication between the people in the room and the people who aren't in the room. The classroom microphones have actually been specifically selected and tuned so that they clearly reproduce the voices from the classroom, even with masks on. We've done a number of tests with different masks and different groups, and there's very little discernible difference. So that we were very excited about that. It doesn't diminish the experience for the remote or in the in-room students. Um, the structures have always had the ability to present from a variety of sources in the room, as well as being bringing in their own equipment so they can use their own laptop, they can use a DVD if they need to, they can use a document camera, many sources, that all continues. Uh, the new room design actually is enhanced by direct connection into Zoom. So what the students in the room see, the students who are remote see directly as well. There is no difference. Matter of fact, the remote students may see better what's actually being presented. In order to best include those remote students in the classroom environment, many of our classrooms, most of them will have large displays on the back wall. So if you can envision yourself as a faculty member in the front of the room, you're looking at the gallery view of your students in the back on a TV that in most cases is a 75 inch display, very large. The small classes, the remote students are actually going to be displayed quite nicely. This gallery view in the back also allows for natural interaction with the students who are in the classroom. So if you would envision that you're in a classroom and you're talking to somebody in the room, you would turn and you would normally turn and talk to the person in the room. The students on the display in the back of the room are essentially in the room. You would turn and 
look to them. When you do that, the microphones in the room are gonna pick you up regardless of where you are, but the camera from the back of the room will also pick you up. So the student you're talking to is going to see you looking at them actually from their vantage point. You're close, but you're not. Um, it really is very seamless. We've had a number of different test groups and put these displays in places that were very convenient so that it's, it's actually quite natural. We're pretty excited about that. Um, there is a video that will be linked on our website tomorrow that actually shows you all of that in a very nice package so that you can actually see what is it? This is, this is one of our demo rooms um, that was not quite completed, but you will see exactly what the student would see and you'll see exactly what the faculty member would see and uh, both remote and in the classroom. It really is, is um, pretty exciting that we can do this. Faculty have also been outfit with tablet laptops and other accessories so that they can better teach regardless of where they are. Um, if for some reason they would need to be quarantined, they would need to be off campus, whatever, um, they can have these facilities at their disposal so that they can teach. They can also bring those tablets in the room. All of this technology has been really engineered so that it enhances the high flex and enables us to teach seamlessly now, but also really enhances the in-classroom experience so that as we move forward, we've really invested in our future here. And I think you'll be really amazed if you get a chance to look at that video at how the technology allows us to really close that gap and that distance and provide a nice seamless transition. That's it for the technology piece. All right, Jim. Thank you very much. We'd now like to move on to the health and safety portion of the webinar. Uh, and to lead that, I'd like to welcome two individuals who have been uh, integral members of the COVID-19 task force uh, and have helped prepare our protocols uh, for a return to campus in the fall. Uh, Gary Hominy, who's our Director of Regulatory Affairs and Risk Management, uh, and Jan Krev, who's the Director of the JCU Student Health and Wellness Center. Uh, Gary? All right. Thank you, Mike. Um, all right, so I'd like to start with an explanation of some of the uh, new COVID-19 induced uh, protocols on campus. Um, as Dr. Johnson and Dr. Herbert uh, already mentioned, uh, masks are going to be a big part of that. Uh, masks are required in all buildings with only a few exceptions. Um, you will not need a mask when you are actively eating or if you're um, in your residence hall room with your uh, roommate, if you have a roommate. Um, masks will be required outside if you cannot maintain a uh, six foot physical distancing. Uh, speaking of physical distancing, that's that six foot bubble that will kind of be around all of us and help us maintain that bubble uh, on campus. Uh, we have been de-densifying classrooms, labs, lounges, cap the cafeteria, elevator. Um, all of those have been, the occupancies have been reduced so that we can maintain that six foot um, physical distancing. Uh, there will be markers on the floor indicating, uh, you know, like six foot hash marks uh, in front of service areas or anywhere where queuing might be re uh, required, um, for example, like at a cafeteria. There will also be plexiglass barrier barriers uh, at all service areas. So these will all be some uh, new things on campus. Um, signage. There will be a lot of new signage on campus. We have your wear your mask signage and we'll be reminding you about physical distancing and washing your hands. Uh, in areas where there's gonna be queuing or um, a service desk, uh, there'll be, you'll see the wait here and the stand here decals on the floor along with the six foot hash marks uh, for social distancing. Um, all of the classrooms, lounges, meeting rooms, They'll all have occupancy 
and layout signage so you'll know how many people can be in that room and how they should be dispersed. Uh, we also have the COVID-19 uh, information signage up and uh, we'll have hand sanitizer signs up. And <clears throat> I mentioned the hand sanitizer signs because um, we have installed a number of new hand sanitizer stations across campus. Um, every card access and high traffic entrance or area will have a hand sanitizer uh, located in that area. All the restrooms have hand sanitizers and locker rooms, computer labs, and residence halls. And each one of these will be identified uh, with a label so as not to be confused with any soap dispensers. Now I'd like to move on to um, our enhanced cleaning protocols. Um, across campus, we have uh, increased our uh, frequency and locations of all of our cleaning. So uh, there's increased uh, frequency of cleaning in restrooms, uh, meeting rooms, classrooms, uh, high touch points. Those are gonna be your handrails, elevator buttons, door handles. Uh, common areas, uh, they will um, all re receive increased uh, cleaning. Uh, residence halls, the shared bathrooms and lounges and athletic facilities and recreation facilities as well. Our um, cleaning contractor, ABM, also has a uh, deep cleaning response team that can uh, or can go to an area where if we feel there's been a COVID exposure or we feel that an area might have been somehow contaminated, uh, these folks have been certified and they can go in and um, uh, address that issue and clean that area. We also have bought them some additional equipment. We have five um, disinfecting foggers. These foggers uh, can be used all across campus. So you, know, you can imagine in a, uh, just for example, restrooms or athletic facilities or things like that where we could uh, roll that out and uh, um, fog an area and sterilize an area. There will also be sanitizing wipes in all the classrooms, meeting rooms, computer labs, and shared residence hall bathrooms. These are big tubs of wipes. Uh, and they'll be available uh, for you to uh, wipe down uh, any area that you may be, uh, may be in. But with all this, there, there's, one, there's one place that our contractor cannot clean and nor can JCU, and that's your hands. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. We have plenty of new uh, hand sanitizing stations across campus, so there's no excuse for not coming in a door and just giving it a little uh, squirt on your hands and wiping them down. Uh, let's see, next, uh, our HVAC upgrades. We have made uh, many improvements to our HVAC system. We have increased the air exchanges and makeup air, so there'll be uh, more of that. Uh, we have increased the frequency of filter changes, and where uh, applicable, we have installed HEPA filters in our systems. And I would also say there's always the opportunity to open a window if weather permits to let more air uh, into any room. We've kind of already touched on classrooms, but again, I want to mention that the classrooms have been densified. The occupancy and seating layouts are, uh, will be on every room door, and we will have on the floor markings where the uh, chairs or tables go and where there is appropriate seating. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, sanitizing wipes will be in all of the classrooms, labs, meeting rooms, com and computer labs, and shared residence bathrooms. Um, the last thing I want to mention is the unidirectional 
exits, entrances, and stairwells. We're gonna have signage that, you know, some stairwells will be up stairwells, other ones will be down stairwells. Uh, you'll, there'll be different entrances and exits to the building. Uh, of course, if there's ever an emergency, you should just uh, exit the building using whatever stairwell or uh, exit is nearby. Uh, but these will all be marked. Uh, they're color-coded um, across campus. And um, with that, I will turn it over to Jan to talk to us about the Health Center and the Health and Wellness Center. Thank you, Gary. First, I'd like to just appreciate um, all of you for just sharing your evening with all of us tonight and listening to what we have to share with you. The JCU Health Center is located in the basement of Murphy Hall. The entrance is on the side where the dining hall building is. It's right across from the dining hall. This semester will be a little bit different. We will not have walk-in appointments. We ask that students first call and do a phone screening with one of the nurses and make a plan either to schedule a telehealth visit or an in-person visit. This phone call will also include a COVID-19 risk assessment. The Health Center plans to do symptomatic PCR testing of COVID-19. And of course, we already test for flu, strep, and mono in our office. JCU Health Center's medical director is a Cleveland Clinic physician, and many of our protocols directly follow Cleveland Clinic's protocols. Cuyahoga County Board of Health and the local health departments will be providing contact tracing if needed on the JCU campus. We will assist with contact information they may need for the case, any pot potential close contacts that they may need to be quarantined. They will do most of the contact work, but JCU will assist to identify those who may be impacted, such as a roommate or a coworker. The Board of Health will collaborate with messaging on campus to provide outreach to students and to staff. We have to be careful about sharing um, information because of HIPAA requirements, and that includes the identification of case information and medical details regarding um, the general public. However, this information can be shared between the health department and the school administration. Students will also be receiving in the next couple weeks an app called Campus Clear. We do expect all students to use this app as it is a daily system symptom assessment. And additionally, staff from our health center will be conducting random temp temperature screening around campus. So what should you do if your student or you feel sick? Generally, we ask you to stay in your residence hall, call the health center. We will do a phone screening and make a plan telehealth visit or an in-person visit. We will probably email paperwork that may need be needed for the visit and students should return the paperwork via email or bring it into their appointment. If the screening for COVID-19 risk assessment is positive, students can come to the health center and get tested. But prior to coming to the health center, we will also um, help the student make a plan either to go to their residential home or to an isolation room on campus. Some of the advanced questions that we received, we're going to go through them now, Gary and I. And so we were asked, does the Cuyahoga County Board of Health, the Cuyahoga County Board of Health is recommending remote learning for uh, K through 12. So what's John Carroll thinking about this? This is a recommendation and many school systems are planning to have schools, students return in person to school. Safety of course is our first top priority and consideration when planning for return of students on campus. Our plans were reviewed by the Cuyahoga County Board of Health and Cleveland Clinic, and their recommendations have been added to our plan. Both institutions agreed our plan is very comprehensive and well thought out, keeping the safety of our students first and foremost. Will all students need to be tested? As of today, our plan is to test, asym or to test symptomatic students only. What is the plan to quarantine students from high-risk area states prior to moving to campus? So students traveling from states outside of Ohio that have been identified on the state of Ohio tra travel warning list should plan to quarantine in Ohio for 14 days prior to coming to campus. Thank you, Jan. Um, see, we had another question here. It said, what is the current inside limit on gatherings in Ohio as of this week? Um, inside uh, gatherings are limited to 10 people or less, unless there's an exemption. And those exemptions come in the form of sports, religious services, food service, education, and uh, these exemptions were pro are provided by the governor. So for 
uh, education, we are bound by the um, six foot rule to make sure that whatever space we're using, uh, people in the space can maintain social distancing. Uh, another one here, what is the current outside gatherings? Uh, what is the current limit on outside gatherings in Ohio as of this week? It's actually the same as the inside gatherings, uh, no more than uh, 10 or less, and the same exemptions apply. Uh, we had a number of questions about, um, uh, well, they revolved around uh, cases on campus, quarantining, isolation, and outbreaks. So I kind of gathered those together. Um, and what I do is kind of, I'm going I'm to parse this out a little bit into, um, let's first just talk about quarantine and isolation. Uh, residence life is set aside a, a limited number of quarantine uh, and isolation rooms. Uh, we have written policies and procedures for students uh, who develop symptoms and need to be quarantined or isolated. Uh, we would prefer that students needing to be quarantined or isolated would uh, go home or return to their residence and, and use our rooms as temporary housing while they arrange for, uh, for transportation to their home. If a student is unable to go home uh, and remains on campus, the university has made arrangements uh, for food to be delivered to the quarantine and, isolate, and isolation area. Uh, there would be a, a regular virtual nurse check-ins with the student. And in most cases, uh, if a student is in quarantine or isolation, uh, regardless of whether they're at home or they're at JCU, um, they should be able to continue their academics online. And if for some reason a student cannot keep up with classes online, they should contact their academic advisor, the academic, their academic advisor or the academic advisor's office and their professor. So the next category that seems to come in is everyone uh, talk about uh, COVID outbreak. Well, we anticipate that there will be cases on campus. Um, we have a protocol for that, which has been reviewed by the Cuyahoga County Board of Health and the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, I think here the underlying question is what is the criteria for closing campus, for closing campus? Obviously, uh, any order from the governor, like that came in uh, March, uh, we would close the campus. Uh, but short of that, JCU is using the Open Smart EDU COVID-19 planning guide from John Hopkins University, which can be found on the web. Uh, well, it can be found, you know, if you Google for it. Um, this, uh, this matrix really comes up with eight trigger points uh, we should consider before we would uh, close campus. It's really not as easy as just saying X amount of cases of COVID on campus. So I'm going to just give you a uh, 30,000 foot view of, of our criteria here. Uh, the first one is the overall health of the JCU community. Um, this is really, you got to remember that when uh, kids come back, not only will we have COVID, but we will still have the flu coming in the, in the fall. So we want to get an idea of the health of the entire campus community. So we will keep track uh, through the Campus Clear app, what's going on in our campus community with flu-like illnesses and COVID-like illnesses. Our next criteria is the, uh, the result of symptomatic cases. So what we're doing here is we want to know the, or look at the percent of tests that are positive and see if it's, if it's increasing or decreasing. So this will be of those uh, individuals that get tested either on or off campus. Next, we want to look at infection clusters. This is the percentage of new cases linked to, to other known cases. And this is important because if we can trace, some, trace something back 
to a particular area and we say, hey, we know that these cases came from this spot, we can address it. If we're unable to link these back, and again, this is through contact tracing, um, then we're into a situation where we would be having community spread and that would be a concern. Uh, the next item we look at is what phase is the county in? So what, what is the situation in the surrounding uh, county and uh, John Carroll? So we, take, we have to take that into consideration as well. Then we want to look at the number of infections in students, faculty, and staff. So these would be actual COVID cases. This is the, where, this is the one everybody thinks of, how many cases are on campus. And we want to know is that increasing or decreasing uh, and put that in perspective with all of the other um, uh, triggers above that we just went through. The next thing we want to look at is the capacity to quarantine and isolate. Uh, there's a finite number of rooms at John Carroll for quarantine and isolation. And we want to keep track of that and evaluate what percentage of those are being used. And obviously, the greater the percentage that are being used, the more concern uh, it would give us. Our next, uh, oh, and we also like to know what is the capacity in the local hospitals as well, along with what's our quarantine and isolation capacity. Then we would look at, um, is there sufficient PPE, personal protective equipment, and testing? Because if either one of those would run short, that would be another trigger, another concern that we would have to take into consideration uh, about closing school or what our next steps would be. And then there's our last one, which are, is our stakeholders complying with, uh, with the mandates. I mean, are they wearing masks? Are they social distancing? And do we see a high level of compliance or do we see a low level? We would have to take that into consideration as well. And when you take all of these things together, you can get a feel as to the direction of, that the university is going with regard to the COVID-19 and what our next steps should be or where we should focus our attention. And again, this is the Johns Hopkins Open Smart EDU COVID-19, which uh, you could even get off of their website. And uh, with that, I will, turn, uh, I will turn it back over to Mike. Thank you, Gary, and thank you, Jan. Uh, next up, we'd like to uh, hear from Lisa Brown Cornelius from the Office of Residence Life, who will talk to us about the residence halls and our dining plans. Lisa? Thanks, Mike, and thank you, everyone. Um, as Mike shared, tonight we're going to share information about the residential living experience and what students can expect from their on-campus dining experience. First and foremost, I want to reiterate our commitment to an engaging residential experience that prioritizes the health and safety of our students and our entire John Carroll community. There is no doubt that the residential experience will be different this year, but we are working hard to develop an experience that maintains our commitment to health and safety while providing opportunities for meaningful relationship development, significant learning, and the creation of memories that will last a lifetime. We all know that this process begins with move-in. Thank you to all of you who have already signed up for your move-in time. Despite our challenging start to the sign-up process, the response to this process has been fantastic. If you have not already signed up for move-in time, please log into your housing portal and select a time from the options available. As you know, our move-in process is staggered and scheduled. We are doing this so we can limit the number of people in, a, in any building at any given point in time and maintain as much as possible appropriate social distancing and physical distancing. We will have an outdoor, relatively contactless check-in process where you will receive your keys and a welcome bag of goodies, including a branded JCU mask and hand sanitizer. As you're preparing to move to campus, and I know that packing is furiously happening, happening, please consider what you're bringing to campus. We absolutely want you to be comfortable in your space, but we encourage you to consider what you are bringing, the time limit in which you're moving in, and if there's any way you can pare down some of those items. Again, we want you to be comfortable, but we want you to consider how you're moving on to campus. 
I also recognize that the time limits and the limits on the numbers of people who can assist you during the process is challenging. Moving in is an exciting time for both our students and their families, whether you're new to John Carroll or if you're a returning student. Please know that we set those limits because of our commitment to the health and safety of our community. And we really appreciate your willingness to partner with us in this process. Once you are here, we are doing many things to prioritize your health and safety. Gary already spoke about the increasing in cleaning that will be occurring. We'll be cleaning community bathrooms twice daily. We will also have the availability of wipes for use in the community bathrooms for if you want to use wipe something down before or after use. We'll also be cleaning high touch and common area locations consistently. For those of you who are in suites or rooms with private bathrooms, we will be providing you with a bucket of cleaning supplies and directions with supplies that have um, cleaning mechanisms that are consistent with what our housekeepings are using that are, that are um, supported in the COVID-19 process. We're also developing furniture and room setups that maximize physical and social distancing. We have determined and posted maximum occupancy locations in, each, in all common areas. At the same time, we've also developed interim policies, all of which can be viewed on the Residence Life website, that are here to prioritize everyone's health and safety. As was indicated earlier, in the residence halls, Masks will be required at all times, except when you are alone or with your roommate in your assigned residential room or suite. Masks must be worn when there is a guest in your room, and masks must be worn when traveling to and from and while in community restrooms. They may be removed, however, when you are engaged in a personal grooming. We also have interim policies related to guests in the residence halls. In order to maintain the appropriate physical and social distancing, and to limit the number of additional individuals in the room, in the residential communities, we are enacting an interim policies um, for the upcoming year. No overnight guests will be permitted in any residential spaces, including other John Carroll students. Guests will be limited in residence hall rooms based on the room type and the number of students assigned to that specific hall room or suite. When guests are in a student room, masks will be required for all in the room. When guests are in your room, we also ask that you maintain six feet of social and physical distancing um, in addition to the mask requirement. Residential students will be asked to keep track of all guests who are in the room in the event that a guest, that they or a guest has positive for COVID-19 and we need a contact tracing is required. Guests who are not affiliated with John Carroll University will not be permitted in the residence halls. We know this is a difficult interim policy, but we are limiting the number of guests in order to limit the risk to the rest of our community. So we appreciate your partnership in that. All residential students um, will be expected to comply with posted occupancy limits um, in community spaces, including in the community bathrooms, study lounges, floor lounges, elevators, and laundry facilities. Your partnership with us is critical to the health and safety of our entire residential community. The RAs are important student leaders who will be educating and enforcing these policies, but they can't do it alone. It will be incumbent upon all members of our community to understand, follow, and remind others to practice and follow these policies. I encourage all of you with your roommates or suite mates to take a look at these policies on the Residence Life website and begin a conversation about what this means for your room or your suite and how you will live together and with others in community. Additionally, as we have shared information about our planning, we have also received questions. So I just wanted to share a, some answers to some of the common questions we received over the past couple days. Earlier this summer, we sent information about opting into a single occupancy room. We knew that some students may prefer that option as they plan to return to campus. We have accommodated all of those requests to date. If you continue to want to explore that option, please contact our office and we can talk with you about what options remain available. Additionally, we know that as students have made decisions about their preferred selection of instruction for the fall, some have chosen to remain at their permanent address and will not be returning to the residence halls in the fall. 
If you have chosen not to live on campus and have been released from your, the residence halls and would like to return in the spring, you're absolutely eligible to do that. We will have more information about the process for returning in the spring as the semester progresses and we know what timelines and options are available. Also, as was communicated earlier this summer, the residence halls in conjunction with the academic schedule will close for the fall semester at noon on Saturday, November 21st. Students will not be required to move fully out of their room if they're planning to remove, return for the spring semester. However, given the length of time between when the halls will close and when the spring semester is scheduled to begin, I encourage you to begin to think about what you will need to take with you in order to successfully complete the academic semester, as well as to prepare for an extended time away from campus. Finally, another common question, if we, if we need to close the residence halls once students have returned to campus, room and board fees will be adjusted according to and as outlined in the housing agenda. I now want to shift my conversation to discuss the on-campus dining experience. As was shared in the campus announcement yesterday, we are pleased to welcome Parker's Dining to campus as our dining partner. We are excited about how they will enhance the campus experience for all students and our entire community. The Parker's team has also been working tirelessly to prepare for our return while prioritizing your health and safety. So what can you expect from the dining experience? Parkhurst is leveraging CDC guidelines and recommendations for safety and health in campus dining. They are training their staff members on enhanced cleaning and sanitation protocols. All of their team members, much like us, will be wearing masks. They will be having signs and new ways of navigating our dining hall and other dining locations in order to maximize social distancing and efficiency within those spaces. There will be frequent and consistent disinfecting processes of all high touch areas, and there'll be signs on different tables in the dining hall and in the in-between and other dining locations on campus that will indicate when a table has been sanitized and is available for use. And when you're finished with that table, you'll turn the sign over, someone will sanitize it in preparation for those coming after you. All, all food will be chef and employee served um, options in places where there have previously been self-serve. Um, they will be using and distributing disposable utensils and cups, again, in an effort to prioritize health and safety. In the location, specifically in the dining hall, but in other dining locations on campus, occupancy and space limitations will be in place. Specifically in SHOT, per local and state guidelines, only 50% of the occupancy will permit it, be permitted in socially distanced ways. Um, once occupancy levels are met, you will be given your meal to go. We recognize that we don't want students to feel like they don't have a place to eat. So we will also be designating locations in the student center where you can eat if the occupancy in the dining hall has been met. So please know that we are accounting for that as we work on our planning. Parkhurst is also excited to offer an app for mobile ordering. That mobile ordering will be available in the in-between and Einstein's. And then we'll also have touchless check-in and cashless dining at all locations and in the dining hall. Finally, as we partner together, please note that we will all be required to wear a mask in all dining locations, except when we are seated and actively eating. More information about dining will be forthcoming as we plan our return to campus. In the meantime, please don't hesitate to follow Parkhurst on social media at John Carroll Eats for additional updates and information. I thank you for your attention to all of these details. Um, as we approach the move-in process, the information I shared tonight, as well as more details about the residential experience will be shared with students and their families via e email. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to the Office of Residence Life via phone or email. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And I can hear the Clock tower chiming, eight bells uh, above the administration building. So we're 60 minutes in and we've reached our final presenter of the evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Mark McCarthy, who's the Vice President of Student Affairs here at John Carroll, uh, to talk about student life and the student experience. Mark? 
Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight and uh, thank you for your patience as we work through so much information and I have more information to share, but I will try to uh, include some of the, uh, the things that I think are most important for you to know. So as Dr. Johnson and the panelists have said, there's no question that critical to our success in opening our campus and keeping it open will really be our shared commitment and responsibility to follow uh, all the guidelines that you've heard about from so many people this evening. I will share that in about a week, uh, students are gonna receive two important pieces of information uh, and some requests for follow-up. The first is gonna be a link to an app that's called Campus Clear. This app will need to be downloaded on your phone or other devices, and it requires you to do a health, uh, daily health assessment for COVID-19. It'll ask you questions about whether you have no symptoms or some symptoms, uh, whether you've been tested positive for COVID, or if you've been in close contact with someone who uh, has been tested positive or is symptomatic. Depending on your response to the questions, you'll be provided additional information about testing, reporting, et cetera. This assessment should be completed every day, and you can start during the weeks prior to your arrival to campus to sort of get in the habit of doing that. So that's the first piece. The second thing you're gonna receive uh, is uh, what we're calling our community commitment. It's essentially a pledge that's grounded in our JCU mission and is focused on the care of each individual and the members of our community. This commitment calls all students to take necessary steps, steps to stay well and to act purposefully to protect each other, both on campus and in the community. It asks that you do um, the following. First, it asks you to protect yourself, uh, to monitor your daily symptoms, to seek medical attention at, uh, as necessary, to follow personal hygiene practices, frequent hand washing and sanitation that we've talked about. Second thing is to protect others. We talked a lot about social and physical distancing indoors and out. We expect that that's gonna to continue to happen, that the face coverings are important to wear at all times, inside and outside, when social distancing can't be maintained. Uh, we ask that you don't attend or host large gatherings on or off campus where masks are not worn, physical distancing is not maintained or possible, and it exceeds the state local requirements. We know, on you know, if you've been watching other campuses, that this is one of the major ways in which this virus is spread by, by students, athletes, others who've come back to campus early and have attended large events off campus with friends. And it's, it's very different than what the atmosphere typically is on a college campus. And we're asking you to abide by that. We're asking you to refrain from inviting non-John Carroll University affiliated visitors to campus, uh, including family members after move-in. We ask you to stay home if you're ill, to follow the directors of self-quarantine if you're exposed to person with COVID and to comply with travel restrictions or self-isolate if you're tested po positive. And we ask that you report to the Student Health Center a positive test or diagnosis of COVID, or if you've been directly exposed to anyone with a confirmed case. And lastly, we ask you to, to help protect the J. Don Carroll community, respect physical and personal space and distancing, uh, participate in testing and contact tracing as needed, keep yourself, the personal space and your communal spaces clean, uh, and to serve as role models for other in following the policies and protocols. So all students are gonna be required to read and sign the commitment document prior to coming to campus, moving into a residence hall or going to a class on campus. This way we can know that you agree to do everything you can to keep yourself and the John Carroll community safe. So we had a lot of rules and restrictions that we've talked about. I guess I'd like to talk a little bit about what campus life will be like this fall. Um, and if you're a returning student, it will certainly be different. If you're a new student, you'll be experiencing student life uh, on John Carroll for the first time in a new and different kind of way. I can promise that all of you will have stories to tell about your, your time at John Carroll during future alumni weekends. Uh, so uh, some people have asked questions about, am I gonna be isolated in my room on campus and not able to go anywhere? Well, that's, that's not what our hope is. We really, we need you to be able to get out of your rooms uh, or to come to campus from your rooms off campus. Uh, so you, there's not an expectation you're gonna be isolated in your room. Uh, but, but as many have said, all of our spaces have been de-densified uh, so that there's less people in those spaces and that masks will be required in the student center, library, other locations on campus. 
Visits uh, to home are discouraged. Uh, we're trying to keep the, the students who are here, here. And that's partly why uh, we have class on Labor Day and have eliminated the, the fall break. We'd like you to stay here, if at all possible. Uh, but it's and it's also important to understand the various state requirements for quarantine when you're entering and leaving Ohio. Uh, and that changes almost weekly. So uh, it, it depends on what's going on in other states. Uh, and quite frankly, it depends upon what New York and other states think about our students in, from Ohio. So you gotta be watching that carefully, otherwise you might be required to quarantine somewhere else uh, and, and before coming back to, to campus as well. So uh, we talked about the visitors and including family and non-JCU affiliated persons uh, are really not permitted on campus. Of course, if there's an urgent situation, uh, visits will need to be uh, uh, approved and you can arrange, to, or you can arrange to meet off campus grounds. Uh, and you would work predominantly with our JCU um, Police Department uh, to notify a situation that needs to be attended to. Okay, so um, we've got a lot of rules there, but what about what about uh, what other things are going to be happening on campus? So I think it's really important to know. We've talked a little bit about the, the student health service, but also other services, student services like the counseling center, the career services, library, and other uh, other activities, uh, other uh, services we provide on campus. They are continuing to be available. Uh, they be, they'll be delivered both through in person and virtual interactions. Um, I think it's really important um, when you're uh, connecting with these departments to call ahead wherever possible for appointments or email uh, so uh, that you know what hours they're available and so that you can make sure that your interaction uh, can be accommodated. One thing that's really important in this time for all of us, I think, is that it's a very high stress time uh, and your mental and physical health and well-being must be a priority. Uh, and we please, and we ask you to please seek out assistance when you're feeling stressed or anxious or ill. Uh, we want to be able to support you in every way we possibly can, uh, and we're available to help do that. So activities and events, uh, they will in fact be available um, through, in a variety of ways. Some of it will be in person, uh, also through virtual experiences or, or a combination thereof. Um, one thing that's really nice about Cleveland uh, is that, uh, and we've been blessed this summer as well, but we're really blessed with beautiful fall weather in Cleveland. So we're gonna be able to offer outdoor activities. We really want our students to be outside uh, and to be able to participate in, in, in activities as long as we can maintain physical distancing in that process. So we're getting very creative about ways we might do that. Smaller groups in, uh, will be able to meet inside and reduce uh, room capacities. Um, we will have uh, some virtual events that are planned as well. There are lots of clubs and organizations. Those meetings will happen in a variety of ways, uh, depending upon the size and location of where they would happen. Um, I will say, and uh, sadly for all of us, uh, unfortunately in October, typically we have uh, a homecoming and a family weekend. Uh, that's at this point not really gonna be possible. Uh, and so we, we hope to maybe perhaps do some events like that that we can do in the spring. Uh, when, we, when we have the opportunity to do that. I think most of you know that we will not have varsity or club sport competitions this semester in the fall. Uh, and we're, we're, but we're following closely all of the NCAA guidelines to have a phased return to sort of re-socialize our athletes uh, and to provide for some conditioning and practice inter-squad activities as we can do that over the course of the semester. So let me give you a couple examples of other things that are happening. Some uh, for our new, our new students, uh, we typically have a streak week. This year we have new streak weekend. That'll be for new students uh, after they arrive and move in campus or are commuting to campus. Uh, that's scheduled August 28th to 30th and we'll have that schedule available. I think it is available or it will be soon on the web. Um, our Center for Student Diversity and Inclusion will be offering a, a welcome back celebration uh, for students and their peer mentoring programs. Uh, our musical arts area will be having virtual concerts and performances. Campus ministry, very active on our campus. Um, they, will, they are gonna have some retreats at, off campus at the Jesuit Retreat House, faith sharing groups. Uh, some of you may have participated in the spring uh, in a virtual God on the Go program. Liturgies programs focusing on social justice. Pastoral counseling will be available from resident ministers as well. We have a student union programming board that's got a lot of creative ideas that they're working on, including some movies on the quad uh, and scavenger hunts, uh, contests. Bingo is a very popular event with prizes. 
Uh, we'll be adding a lot of different competitions, social media things, as well as uh, virtual concerts and other activities. Some of you are in or are interested in, in being involved in our fraternity and sorority life. Uh, we have nine chapters on our campus. They will be uh, doing um, recruitment activities uh, and social and educational activities um, this uh, fall semester. Um, most of that will be virtual in terms of recruitment, uh, but they'll be also having activities they're sponsoring as well. Um, the Center for Service and Social Action is organizing a wide range of community service and course-based service learning activities. Um, they will be using virtual formats for much of that. And we're excited, very excited about the renovation that's happening on our campus right now uh, to create a new, uh, what we call the Corbo Room, which is really the, uh, the, the fitness area for individual fitness uh, machines, et cetera, et cetera. That is undergoing uh, a major renovation and expansion. It'll be opening uh, in the middle of September. In the meantime, we have a new fitness studio that opened last year and the intramural gym that will be opening later this month. And, and we've spaced out uh, opportunities in there for individual fitness. There'll be some classes available for spin, uh, some equipment that we have. You can bring some of your own equipment, although we don't check out a lot of equipment uh, because of the health reasons. Um, all, all of the users will swipe their, uh, their Carol card at the rec desk uh, and complete a temperature screening before they will enter the IM gym or fitness studio. Um, and uh, there's a lot that we've taped workout squares on, on half of the IM gym so that uh, people can do their exercising, uh, et cetera. At the moment, we're not using a reservation system yet for space in any of these locations, although when the Corbo room opens, and I think it'll be quite popular with new, all kinds of new fitness equipment in there, uh, we may need to in institute a reservation system so that people uh, can set up a time when they'll be there and uh, limit that as well. So we're really excited about all of that uh, and the opportunities that we have. Um, really, uh, many of these things are run and organized by students for students. And so, you know, the sky's the limit for creativity. And we look forward to those, see what, what comes up uh, as we, we prepare for the fall. So anyway, uh, so what, I guess my final things I want to talk about is what do you do to prepare to arrive to campus? Um, and I guess, so what I would say is for the two weeks prior to arrival, um, our hope is that you'll begin to use the Campus Clear Daily Symptom Assessment app, uh, that you'll read and sign the JCU Student Commitment document. Um, and we really hope that you prepare yourself to come to campus as healthy as you can be. So we're encouraging you to avoid non-essential travel and large gatherings for the 14 days prior to coming to campus. That's gonna to be tough. I know uh, that people like to have send off parties before they come or last minute gatherings with friends. Uh, it's really important that those are the kind of events that on other campuses have created a real um, uh, urgent need. As soon as they came to campus, we found positive tests uh, because of the gatherings people had before they arrived. So we're really discouraging that and hoping that you will, uh, will avoid those kind of gatherings. The last thing I would suggest is to purchase, we, we do have some face masks available on campus and residential students will be receiving them. And, uh, but I, I encourage you to purchase and use face coverings and bring them along so that you, enough along so you can keep them laundered and ready to go. So with that, I, I wanna conclude by just thanking you all for your patience uh, in all of this tonight. And uh, we, we are uh, felt that we are very prepared for your arrival and look forward to uh, really meeting you as new students and, and visiting and returning with, with the returning students to have a great semester. Thank you. Mark, thank you. And to all of our panelists this evening, uh, we appreciate your time. Most importantly, to our students, parents, families, friends who are watching, uh, we did our very best to cover all the questions that came in uh, via covid response at jcu.edu. If your question wasn't asked, uh, we will do our best to reply to you via email. You can continue to use that email in the buildup for the fall semester. Uh, we will monitor it. Uh, and someone from our uh, panel or other, uh, otherwise will uh, be in touch with you. Uh, again, thank you. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we look forward to seeing you very soon here on John Carroll's campus. Thank you and good night.